welcome to the reading room. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming Daryl H.Y. Lum, the author of several books including Sun, Short Stories and Drama, and Pass On, No Pass Back. His plays include Oranges Are Lucky and The Beer Can Hat. His stories are written in Hawaii Creole English, also known as Pigeon. He is co-founder of Bamboo Ridge Press with Eric Chalk. Daryl H.Y. Lum has edited and has been published in many anthologies and collections and is the recipient of several awards, including the Association for Asian American Studies National Book Award and Elliot's Cades Award for Literature and the Hawaii Award for Literature. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Your stories and poems have situations and events that many can relate to, especially in Hawaii. How would you describe your work? What do you write about? I think I write about sort of everyday things. Um, people who are maybe in your family or you're an uncle or um, uh, ordinary folks. So, <laughs> you know, um, I want to represent the everyday people, um, you know, more than um, a heroic character or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know I noticed when reading your work and we'll, we'll get a, <laughs> a little taste, the audience will get a taste of it. Yeah, there's a lot of um, what you said earlier, local references and um, basically a lot of your stories and plays. I know the audience really relate to it. You know, they, they're familiar with uh, those type of situations. Uh, there are many memorable scenes from your books, Sun, Short Stories and Drama and Pass On, No Pass Back and in various publications and plays. What is your favorite story or play, and why is this work your favorite? And would it be possible for you <laughs> to read some of your work? <laughs> um, what is my favorite? The, my favorite is whatever the one I'm working on right now, right? <laughs> um, because when you go back to the older th things that you've written previously, you, you you see all the mistakes and all the flaws in it, and so ah, that's terrible. That's junk, right? So, um, yeah, my favorite is right now, right? Oh, I see. And uh, you have this um, this wonderful um, play that it would be great if we could um, uh, read, where there's a sign waiver for candidate Abe, a sign waiver for candidate Lee. And the setting is a busy Honolulu Street downtown and both jockey for position on the same corner. Wow, your sign's so big, you gotta move down. You're hitting my sign. Take it easy, Abe guy. I know can help my guy get long name. Besides, I was here first. Not Abe, Abe, Japanese name. You know can tell. Abe, Abe, whatever's. Your guy, how long he had that name? His name's so long. I bet he had to change extra to make that sign, yeah? I bet he wasn't born with that name. I don't know. That's his real name, I think. Not. Probably only for election when he went and filed his papers. Suddenly, the Pake went to adopt one Japanese, Filipino, Portuguese, and Hawaiian name. Only thing mis missing is Vietnamese. No worry. His wife got that covered. I mean, not on purpose. L, quotation mark, Keoki, Masagi, Kim, Suk, Tyrone, quotation mark, Lee. Where the hell Tyrone came from? So what if, if you put one quotation mark around bullshit names that ma makes it all right? What the L stand for? He gave one real first name. Lyman. Lyman Lee. Ha <laughs> ha. No lie. Lyman. What, what, what a name for a politician. Ain't that the truth? Ha ha ha. He's an honest guy, no lies, and no worry. His wife get the Vietnamese and the hyphen, Mrs. Trin hyphen Lee. He wouldn't cover all the bases, yeah? But that's not his real name, eh? He already thought of that. Lieutenant Governor office, name change, cheap. You think people won't believe that? He really all mix up like that. Like my auntie say, when you don't know who to vote for, vote for a Japanese name because get so many Japanese, they're always going to win. The Japanese own, not only vote for Japanese. They will if you go enough bondance. 
Masagi. That's his real middle name. Like you can Masagi my backy. No act stupid. He go by Masa to the old folks, Mike to the young folks, Boy Sang to his parents. Ho Japanese all the way, yeah. Probably when Manoa Japanese School every day after school was chairman of the Simon Booth at the Japanese School Field Day, winner of the two man slipper race, when roll cabbage with the broomstick and win for his team. What a guy. Ah, uh, he likes sushi too, I think. I don't know about Japanese school. He lucky. My uncle always say, vote for the Pake name. They're going to be tight with the money. No need raise tax. So your guy Pake too. You sure? Lee can be Chinese or Korean or Haoli. Lee, pretty sure Chinese. No more any Haoli. Look at the picture. He got to get in, in the sun more. He's so white. Maybe he was adopted. Tell him put sunscreen first. Yeah, he looked like he can burn. You don't know who you holding the sign for? Chinese or Korean or Haoli? Come on, tell me. I'm not going to tell anybody. I know, I know. He pake when he in Chinatown. He yopo when he go Palama Market. He haoli when he go Kahala. And son of a gun. His wife, Filipino Vietnamese, Hanai to an Hawaiian military family in Wahewa. How you know? Wild guess. At least my guy honest. What? You know, honest, abe, haha. My guy going to win. He get the Teamsters and the Government Workers Union on his side. How come I don't see no Teamsters or Government Workers waving with you? They're busy working, that's why. Just like me, I work in my job. What job is that? This one? I wish I had union for this job. No more benefits for flat feet or accommodation for disability. You know one volunteer? $10 an hour. Paid 15 minute break every two hours or 30 minute lunch break. Not bad. Sometimes my guy come, bring one bento for me and wait for 10 minutes and then go on to the next corner. Sometimes he tell me go eat in his car with the AC on but the damn car get his face plastered all over the doors and guy slow down and look to see if I stay him. When I look up and they see I'm not him, they stick finger and drive away. Hard to please some people. More better go eat in the park by the bathroom. Except get the drunk guy over there and he watch me eat until I give up and give the rest of my lunch to him. I come back, wave some more, still hungry. That's why hard. And what's your disability, waving for the wrong candidate? Yeah. My guy gets strict rules, no can smoke. Bad for the image. People so stupid, they mistake the sign waiver for the candidate. Candidate is the one with the red carnation lay, stupid heads. He the one sweating bullets in his long pants, long sleeve white shirt, red sash, carnation lay, and big straw papale. Look like one Royal Hawaiian band musician who stayed lost. The band forgot to tell him where the parade start. Or maybe he like Danny Kalikini. Aloha, Kaniala here. Wave to the tourists. Don't can tell when the bugger going to show up, so always got to be uh, on the lookout. No can slack off. He can wave like anybody's business, even to the guys going down the other side of the street. Dogs growl at him because he's standing there next to the um, fire hydrant. At least he go and throw one big party after election power, right? Eh, he's so cheap. Last time he tell all his supporters go Blaisdell Center for Thanksgiving lunch. I thought, oh, this going to be good. Blaisdell Center? He get plenty supporters, huh? Was the free lunch from Salvation Army. I don't know, maybe he went donate one turkey. Turn out, we got to wear the Honest Abe t-shirt and help serve the people, mostly the rich old folks from the senior citizen center, the guys from the housing and the homeless. But mostly the homeless stay away. They don't like eat lunch with rich people who move their seat when they see them coming. To shame. Abe go down the line, he shake everybody's hand like he already the mayor. 
but the real mayor already went down the line and he get one policeman in front making sure nobody shake his hand too hard or try to make up high, down low, too slow handshake. So everybody wondering, who this guy on his Abe? The place was packed. So I had to sit at the end of the cafeteria table next to one kid who went move seat because I gave him my piece of pie. The real mayor, get all kind of guys sitting at one table. They no more lunch yet, but they all get the lanyard with the ID card attached. Mayor come, everybody get up, make room for him and his assistant and the policeman. Smooth. Salvation Army guy marching with one turkey steaming on the platter, holding up high on his shoulder. Everybody clap. I look at my turkey and look like school lunch turkey. Half duck meat, half white meat. Not like the parade turkey. Gotta laugh, just like my candidate. Perfect slice, like one piece of bologna. Actually, my turkey like bologna or bologna like turkey. Tastes pretty good. I'll become clap his hand on my back. Eat up, he tell. Can get seconds if you like. Let me know. What? If you like seconds, you just throw away your plate and stand in line again. Not like get one cafeteria lady who tell, gotta finish your green beans before you get seconds. <sighs> so I end up sitting by the drunk guy that from the park bedroom. Somebody must have told him about the free lunch. I recognize him, he recognized me, give me the head jerk, like now him and me compadres. Now I stuck. I not can move my seat because gonna be like I not like sit by him and my shirt say Abe on the front and Abe always tell we gotta have kindness in our heart for all kind of people. The stink as well as the not so stink. He smile and tell me bone appetite. I thinking, apple no more tit. Oh, French like this, French like on the they say on the uh, Food Channel. I say itadakimas. Only thing now is, wait for them, say grace, and eat fast. Mm. Oh, thank you. Wow. I I notice your work is so powerful. You know, it it has. It has like these everyday occurrences, but then it makes these big political statements as well. So I, I really appreciate your work. Uh, since you write in standard English and Hawaii Creole English, Pigeon, were there challenges in maintaining authenticity in your creative work? And what is your advice for writers? <laughs> it's hard to talk about authenticity because that's the only language I know. Right. I, um, I suppose you could say my first language is was is pigeon, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and that's the language that is you know closest to my heart, <laughs> right? And uh, for me, the language that is most expressive. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as for you know advice. Uh, I think every writer has to hear the, the voice that is their writing voice and the voice of their characters, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and for me, it is, you know, the everyday people, people like my family and yeah. my relatives and my uncles. Um, uh, it's fiction, but it's kind of a, a combination of, of characters that are um, sort of based on real life. Wow, yeah, it's it's amazing. Like nowadays, we have a lot of writers who write in pigeon, uh, but I know, especially in the earlier days, uh, before Bamboo Ridge Press came about, and we had a lot of the literary, other literary journals. And I, I remember when I went to school, I I didn't see um, literature. Um, written in pigeon or you know it's probably the choices of my my teachers and so when, when you were growing up how did you um, cross over from the standard English to pigeon in your writing <laughs> or maybe it's the other way around <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, 
I don't know, like, like, like most uh, parents, they wanted you, their kids to be successful. So I was always told, you know, uh, don't speak pidgin, um, um, to always speak proper English. Even as my father was saying that to me in pidgin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and he would always point out uh, some local kid, you know, who he came in contact with or who was on TV. Oh, look that kid. He talked like one howling. Oh. And, and so that was always the, the elevated language. Mm -hmm. um, and even as a kid, you know, that was... Um, somehow I knew it was fake. You know, I couldn't... I mean, I could speak like that, but it was, it was hard work, right? Yeah. You, you had to always edit yourself. Um, um, and um, I think it was Lois Ann who's, oh, yeah. who, who sort of remarked, you know, you got to just let the words bust out, right? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I think a lot of um, students and a lot of people growing up in Hawaii, you know, the, the first language, like wh I remember when I was growing up, the first language that I, I think I heard was pidgin, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and then I didn't realize that other people, you know, until like you speak to someone else who's speaking fluent, like uh, standard English, then you realize, oh, okay, like people are <laughs> correcting me and, you know, so then there, there's that difference in the, because uh, it's a different language. Ah, oh, so interesting. Um, some stories that you write include personal experiences. How do you deal with exposing yourself through your work? Are there topics that you would not write about? That's an interesting question because what I write is fiction. You know, oh. it's made up. It's you know, of, of course, it's based on um, you know people and events and, uh, that are real, but. Um, you know what is on the page is is made up is uh, is fiction. Um, are there any topics that you are taboo where it's like no, I don't want to write about that? That's a, a good question because I I think as a writer you need to um, separate out the the um, the editing part. I think when you you know the the writing process, you really have to let the story tell itself. Um, and if you have that little voice in the back of your head saying, "Oh no, that's stupid," or "That's junk," or you know that, it, that making judgments, um, I think it makes it more difficult. I, it, the um, uh, it's important to separate the writing process from the editing process. You know, you can do the editing later, but if you if you try to do edit yourself and write at the same time, um, I think that's when you get stuck. You know, that's mm -hmm. when you um, you know get writer's block, or 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 or, or, or that's where where you lose track of the story that you want to tell and as a writer that that's your main job you got to tell the story yeah thank you that that's good advice because i think a lot of writers they're too self-critical or they'll like stop the story while they're writing the story mm -hmm. so yeah um and and i, I believe you answered our next question about <laughs> writer's flock which is so so like if if you have a like a student or i know sometimes students are blocked or you know or anyone who's interested in writing and for some reason they're like oh i can't write today you know there's something stopping them do, do you have any solutions on how to get past writer's block like what do you recommend doing well i mean i think writer's block is a function of that that thing that we're talking about, you know, writing and editing at, at the same time. Um, and, you know, I know there's lots of people who say, well, you should write whatever, mm -hmm. 500 words a day yeah. or, or, you know, three pages or whatever. Um, um, that doesn't work for me. <laughs> you know, you, I 
just write when I feel like it. Oh, right? right. Yeah. Um, um, but at the same time, like I said, you gotta turn off that editing voice, mm -hmm. and um, the writing process. So, so the question about are there taboo subjects? Well, mm -hmm. in the writing process, for me, you know, uh -huh. there aren't any, uh -huh. because whatever's taboo, you can fix it in the editing part. That's right? true. But uh, so. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And, you know, a lot of people appreciate your work. You're an award-winning author, and we discuss your work in classrooms. Is, think of a time before all the publications. What advice do you have for anyone who wants to be a writer? Just write. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, um, it, you know, like I said about the writing and the editing, um, Tell the story. Tell the story that that you that you have to tell, um, um, and that's the most important thing to me. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, and you know, I just have to say thank you to you and Eric for starting Bamboo Ridge Press. I know me. Well, I, I'm really grateful, and I know that gratitude is felt by a lot of writers, especially writers. Um, who are raised in Hawaii and to see their work in the literature um, in Bamboo Ridge Journal mm -hmm. and to be taught in classes, it really validates uh, their experiences. So, so thank you for, <laughs> for all your contributions. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your work uh, and for spending time with us in the reading room. And I just want to say thank you, everyone, for joining us for another episode of The Reading Room. And we would like to thank uh, Daryl H.Y. Lum for joining us. And uh, we look forward to another episode uh, in The Reading Room. Thank you so much.